We have traveled all over Kenya to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the help they need to improve their farms, get better yields, and increase profits. We'll see how farmers from across the region can benefit from our expert advice and learn from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmers' experiences as they shape up their shambas. Welcome to the Shamba Shape Up Safari. Hello and welcome to Shamba Shape Up. Today we are in Kiambu County and we are visiting Michael and Pauline Morito. Yes, Michael owns three greenhouses and he grows tomatoes. But his tomatoes are not doing well and Michael does not know why. And that's why we are here to find out exactly what's wrong. So, Detective Tony, do you think this would help? Ah, exactly what I need. All right, madame, lead the scene of a crime. Follow me. Meet our farmers. Michael and Pauline Morito. They have three children, including Sami. Their farm is in the tea growing region of the beautiful Kiambu County. Tony, I think this is going to be a lovely shape up. Hello. Michael. Hello. Hello. Pauline, how are you? How are you? Thank you. It's so good to be here. You are welcome. Show us your farm. So, there is greenhouses. There is a kitchen garden, lovely cabbages. And they have four cows. And three acres of tea. And a chicken house for Kenyaji chickens. Ah, Pauline and Michael. Yes. Yeah. How can we be of help? There's a disease, you can, as you can see, the tomatoes. Mm. And also, I can see my cow, it does not produce really enough milk. Mm. Well, we'd better call our experts. And pitch the tent so we are ready for work. So, Michael and Pauline Shamba is doing well. But they still need some help. And as usual, we've got a lot of ideas that we want to introduce them to. We'll be seeing how we can raise milk yield by improving animal hygiene. And getting more from your Kenyaji chickens by targeted feeding. But first, we're going to do a double feature on greenhouse tomatoes. Yes, while Tony is going to be checking on bacterial wilt, I am going back into the greenhouse. I'm going to check for lead blight and tuta absoluta. Okay, Caro, we'll see you later. Let's go to work. Okay. Growing vegetables in a greenhouse is a good way to make money. But pests and diseases can be a big problem. Michael's tomatoes are not looking very good. So I've invited Sami from Osho to come over and find out what has been going on. Let's go and meet him. It seems Sami has seen three major problems. The first and most serious is lead blight. Now you can see the effect on the leaves. Mm -hmm. You can see. Mm -hmm. There is a blight, there is a burn ban-like okay. uh, symptom mm. and then even it extends to your fruits look at how it does to your fruit mm. okay. when it goes further you can see that it even cuts off the the stems so you will find that your whole crop is destroyed you could be having a crop today and tomorrow when you're coming there's no crop that mm. it spreads very fast it will only take a short time to destroy the whole crop from here going up there that's how serious it can be well that's very bad news let's see what else Sami has found so the other problem we are looking at, and I said, is that of tuta absoluta. Mm. So this is a typical damage by the pest, tuta absoluta, you can see. And in fact, if you are careful enough, you will see that the green part of the leaf has been eaten away. And that makes it impossible for the crop to do the photosynthesis and making up of the fruits. So once you see this damage, you are sure of the pest will also attack the fruits. The fruits will get perforated, there will be perforations, and such fruits will not get into, reach into the market. Well, if this is not bad enough, Sami has found a third problem with the tomatoes. So the other problem we were looking at is that of white flies. And here they are. These are the white flies. These are pests, and they suck uh, sap from the plant. So the, all the plant nutrition is taken away by the pest. So, and the bad thing about this pest, white fly, is that uh, 
they populate very quickly. You'll find that you'll start with a small number this time. In about two, three days, four days, they, they are all over. One, they will distract you because now you, they are small insects, they will be all over you. Two, they are sucking nutrition from the plant. And three, they will encourage um, the formation of the soot mold. And this is the soot mold. This, it looks like this. There's the black soot on the leaves. All these pests. Okay. Hmm. I wonder if the tomatoes were planted in the right way to prevent pests and diseases such as late blight taking hold. What do you think he should have done to maybe prevent it? The spacing for his crop is so close. Okay. He's doing only a foot difference from one plant to the other. Mm. So when we, we have some potential source of disease, it spreads quickly because plants are so jammed, they're so close together. Okay, so it's best to plant in a zigzag pattern, leaving at least 60 centimeters between each row and 45 centimeters between each plant. But is there anything else Michael should have done to avoid late blight? He should have done a preventive spray for that disease. Mm -hmm. And Osho Chemicals, we have a product we call Mistress. Mistress. Mistress, yes. I came with one uh -huh. for demonstration purposes. Okay. And here it is. Ah. Mistress. It is double action. It's preventive uh -huh. and curative ah. at the same time. Fill a knapsack with 20 liters of water. Add 40 grams or 4 tablespoons of Mistress. Mix and do a foliar spray once every two weeks. But what about the white flies? As Osho Chemicals, we have a solution for it. These two products. Uh -huh. So Nimbacidin, we start with it. This is an organic product derived from neem. Neem, naturally, will deter pests from laying eggs. Then number two, I'll tell you, is the final flight. flight. The liquid part, which is being sapped out by the white fly, uh -huh will be contaminated by final. So you will have an immediate knockdown of the same, okay. of the white flies, that is. Add 60 milliliters nimbacidin and eight grams or two teaspoons of final flight into a knapsack. Fill the knapsack with 20 liters of water, mix and spray once every 14 days. The other problem we have in the farm, and that is the tutor absoluta. It's the tomato leaf, Moth. The pest is so dangerous, it can cause 100% loss uh, of the crop. Okay. So we have a product we call VAP Comic. Add 100 milliliters of nimbacidin and 10 milliliters of VAP Comic into a knapsack. Fill the knapsack with 20 liters of water, mix and use as a foliar spray. Spray once every 14 days. You want to assure Mr. Morito here that if he was to buy these products, yes. he's assured of higher yield? He'll be assured of higher yield. Uh -huh. He will also be assured we won't keep on fighting the same pest over and over and over and over. So your cost of production will be pushed down. And I'm sure Morito here is very happy, yes? Yeah, yes. very much. Yes. We've had quite a very informative session and we are very grateful to Sami here. But prevention is always better than cure. So if Wana Morito here had spaced out his tomatoes and maybe sprayed them, then these problems will not be there. Michael's tomatoes have a lot of problems. Now, I'm worried he might have one of the most serious, bacterial wilt. So, I've invited Rose, an expert from crop nuts, to see if she can find out if Michael's tomatoes have the disease. Once bacterial wilt take hold, it can kill all the plants in a greenhouse very fast. So, Let's meet Rose and find out more about the disease and how it can be prevented. Now, Rose, what is bacterial wilt? Okay, bacterial wilt is a disease which is caused by a bacteria. And this bacteria affects more than 200 species of plants. After that, the plant will die. It so, will never recover. Even if you water it, even if you do anything, it will never recover. So the farmer will go into huge, huge losses. Huge losses if he doesn't take action immediately. Sounds very dangerous. I'm sure, Rose that you've got measures that farmers can use to protect their crops against bacterial wilt? There are several of them, and the first thing to do is to ensure that the, the soil you are going to use to plant, the planting media, has to be clean. And that one, you can do that by making sure that you test your soil before you, you plant. The second thing that you need to do is the 
to ensure that the water you are using is also disinfected before use. Before you enter your greenhouse, what measures have you put at the door? Put disinfectants. Okay, the main chemical which is easily available even to the local farmer is the jig. Put it at the door. When people come to the greenhouse who are working there, they will step on it and leave any problem on the mat. Have shoes which are, uh, are only used in the greenhouse so that in case of any problem outside, it doesn't come to the greenhouse. The other thing that you can do is to restrict the movement of people. Don't allow people to come into your greenhouse anyhow because you don't know where they have been. And that way we can help uh, to prevent this disease. And the key of them all is to ensure you don't have weeds in your greenhouse. Because some of these weeds are host plants for the bacterial roots. To find products in your area, Kropnas have a website called shambaza.com. In a web page address box, type shambaza.com. When the site loads, you'll see a box on the left where you can type in your question. In this case, we'll enter bacterial wilt. Next, click on the search button on the right. Click on the solution you're interested in. You'll see a detailed information on the product and a telephone number to contact the supplier directly. There is also an email option. Fill in your details and the supplier will get back to you. All thanks to shambaza.com. Now let's go and test uh, Michael's tomatoes to see if they've got bacterial wilt. There is a simple test for bacterial wilt that can be done on the farm. Remember, Always dip your shoes in the disinfectant foot bath on entering the greenhouse. And before handling plants, clean your hands with antibacterial soap. Then do a crop walk to look for plants that may be affected. Early symptoms include the wilting of the plant's top leaves. If you see a sick plant, cut some section of the stem from the base of the plant and place them in a bag. And don't forget to avoid spreading disease. Sterilize your clippers between cuttings as well. Take the samples to a clean area away from the crop. You will need a small jar and some water. So the first thing that we need to do is to make sure we, we cut the, some, the plant at the base. What happens with bacteria? They go down. They don't warp the plant. You put your water, so the water you put, it should be enough for the plant to suspend, not to dip it so mm -hmm. deeply. Mm -hmm. And uh, you tie your, your plant sample and then suspend it over the water. After some five minutes, if it has the bacteria in it, yeah. it will stream. That is, the, the bacteria is coming out of the plant, it is going downwards. That's why I told you, bacteria go down. And if you look through the glass, you can see that... If it is positive, it, you will find a stream of milky streaming. Mm -hmm. If there is nothing, it will not stream. It will remain clear. The water will remain very clear. And in this case, I'm getting excited because, Michael, I'm not seeing any streaming. Are you? I don't want to see anything. Is it but a positive sign? It is very positive because he doesn't have the disease in his farm. And as we saw earlier, this is one disease that it's hard to get rid of it once you have it in the greenhouse. How does that make you feel? I'm feeling very happy. Good. To be totally sure, you can send a sample of the crop to Crop Nuts for testing. So, we've learned how to test for bacterial wilt. And how to manage and treat late blight. But on this farm, Michael Morito is the real expert. So, we've asked him to give us his number one top tip in farming. The idea I would like to share with other farmers is about the biogas digester so that I can stop looking for firewood because in this area it is the firewood is very expensive because we don't have enough trees. If you have about two cows, you will get enough slurry to make biogas that will be used in your home. Even during the cold weather, you will get gas that is enough to cater for your daily needs. That. Very impressive, and he has designed it himself. Very clever. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up after the break. How to keep dairy cows clean and productive. And Kenyaji chicken feed for bigger profits.
Welcome back to Shamba Shape Up. We are in Kiambu County and we are visiting Michael and Pauline Muritu. We've seen how to stop greenhouse pests and how to avoid getting bacterial wilt. But we also want to find out about dairy hygiene and improving Kienyeji chickens. Well, let's get to work. See you later. Bye. Barasa is an expert from Unga. They have introduced a new targeted feeding system for Kienyeji birds. It could be just what Michael needs to turn his Kienyeji into thriving business. What is your quick, quick observation comments? The structure of the house is okay for me. The only thing I'm worried about is the hygiene. There's uh, dirt on the floor, uh, the equipments are dirty, mm -hmm. and uh, with the dirt, I don't think you're able to achieve the good production you as a farmer. Michael projection, the future is having 200 chickens. Do you think that is possible in here? With the housing structure I've seen, the measurements is about uh, 10 by 20 feet. The area of the house is about uh, 200 square feet. And the Kenyaji takes about spacing of about one square feet. So 200 birds would comfortably fit in this house. So, remember, one bird for every square foot of space in the chicken house. But what kind of profit will Michael get from his 200 birds? The cock sell are about 1,000 shillings or more. 200 birds will give you revenue of about 20,000 shillings. It remain as the costs, which is the labor, the feeds, the vaccines, I'm sure we're going to remain with a comfortable profit uh, and we'll be a happy farmer. That's only if he feeds them well. Yes. So, Michael, what do you feed your chickens? Okay, I feed them with the, chick the kitchen leftovers and sometimes the cow feeds. Is there a special way to feed Kenyaji chickens? Yes, there's a special way you need to feed the Kenyaji chicken. Just like other animals, what to give your bird is supposed is what you get. If you give it poor feeds, poor nutrients, you get poor products or poor number of eggs. You need to give your birds the diet that's able to meet its requirement from young stage to the laying stage. Unga farm care has Fogo Kenyeji range that you need to give your birds. We have Fogo Kenyeji chick mash. We have Fogo Kenyeji growers mash and we have Fogo Kenyeji layers mash. Giving Kenyeji feed targeted to three different stages, chicks, growers and layers, increases egg production and adds weight to the birds. From day one until the end of month two, give Fogo Kenyeji chick mash. This builds good body frame. A chick should consume two kilograms of chick mash over the eight weeks. From month three until the point of lay, give Fugo Kienyeji growers mash. This helps the bird to gain weight and encourages early laying. A bird will consume around seven kilograms growers mash in total. From when laying starts, give Fugo Kienyeji layers mash. This helps increase egg production and improve quality. Give 140 grams layers mash per bird per day. Let's get started. So, the first thing we need to do is to get this chicken house cleaned up. If Michael wants to keep birds in here, he's going to have to be free from pests and diseases. He also needs to make sure he has separate areas for the three stages of bird. One for the young chicks feeding on chick mash. Another for the growers feeding on the grower's mash, and one for the layers who will be fed on layers mash. That way, the right food will reach the correct bird. But time is running out. The chicken house needs to be clean, and our day is almost over. So, Karis, yes, how long do you think this is going to take? About two to three hours. No, Karis, we don't have two to three hours. I need one minute, one minute. Come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Hurry up. Hey. Well, I'm hoping we still have time to meet our final expert, John from Coopers. He's going to give us some advice on dairy hygiene. Cattle need clean areas as well as chickens, and dirty cattle sheds can lead to mastitis, which is one of the biggest reasons for unproductive dairy cows and low milk yield. If cattle stalls are kept clean and free from dirt, farmers could protect their cows and increase their profits. So, let's see what John has to say. 
How does that dirt affect the cows? Dirt harbors bacteria and harbors a lot of microorganisms. Mm. And when this microorganism comes, they get into the udder of the cow. And this now brings in infection. How does the cleanliness of the udder affect yeah. production of milk? The udder is a factory. And this is where we harvest our milk from. Once we get these bacteria through the teeth to the udder, we get a condition or a disease called mastitis. When a cow gets infected with mastitis, you, can, you lose production, you incur vet cost um, to treat the condition, you can lose that teat. When you lose that teat, then you are forced to cull that cow prematurely before the time for culling. Then there is that withdrawal period for milk. Once it's on treatment, you're not selling this milk and you're not certain whether the teat is going to recover. And you can get even cross infection if you don't manage it properly from one cow to the other. So it's, a, it's disastrous to have mastitis in your, in your heart. I have had cases of mastitis. How can you help me on that? The issue is just how you can control that and how you can clean the shed. Yeah. What you do is you clean with a disinfectant that can kill both bacteria, fungi, or those disease-causing organisms. This is called cuparside. So, time to start another cleanup. First step is to remove the cow. Then add sawdust in the cow pens so that they can rest in a clean, dry area. And finally, spray with cuparside to kill the bacteria that causes mastitis. This will control for seven days and will kill all the bacteria. You mix it with water in a ratio of uh, 40 ml to 20 liters, then you clean with it weekly. That is step one of controlling mastitis. The other one is now when milking. You need to disinfect now the, the factory that we said is the udder. To wash the udder pre-milking, we use and disinfect that with, with mastite. Use mastite to kill all the bacteria on the cow's udder. Don't share towels with other cows. Sharing towels can spread any dirt or disease that might be of harm to them. And before you milk, you need to soothe those teeth. You soothe with the Cooper milking salve. The best of Cooper milking salve is that it has a disinfectant and it has ranolin. This ranolin will smoothen the, the teeth, will control the chaps, and will soothe actually the cow. So it's like you're massaging the cow with the with this milking salve. So, after cleaning the shed with cuparside, washing the udder with mastrite, and soothing the teats with Cooper's milking salve, you can safely begin milking. Ideally, this should take no more than seven minutes. After milking, you teat deep. This will give you a protection for the next 12 hours, after the, the time taken before the next milking. After milking, the teeth remain open, so use mastrite teeth dip again in a ratio of one to two with water to make sure no bacteria gets into the teeth canal. And when you do this, you have controlled mastitis and you have kicked mastitis out of your farm. Mm -hmm. So, with our cow shed cleaning up nicely, I wonder how Tony did with the chicken shed. Well, it looks like the chicken house is almost ready too. Chickens also need clean sawdust or wood shaving to walk on and it's a good idea to spray disinfectant here too so that you can avoid pests and diseases getting into the chicken's house. Now, let's see what Michael thinks. Michael, here we are. What do you think? It's amazing. Happy? Very happy. Good. Yeah. Fantastic! All your day's work for the Shamba Shape Up team. Pauline and Michael, eh? the Moritos. Yes. We are very happy to have been here. So what is the one thing that has made you happy with this visit? Most importantly, I have learned about the bacteria wilt. Mm. How I can detect it in my plants and how I can test whether it is truly bacteria wilt. Also, I have learned how to keep my cows more hygienic. Mm. So by next time when you come, you'll find my tomatoes will be much better, bigger mm -hmm. and more, mm -hmm. and also the cows will have increased. You'll find more milk. <laughs> You're going to find more cows, more milk, 
more, more tomatoes, chicken. more chickens, mm. wonderful. Mm.